Not Your Typical Hike by Cave. Hello, Swamp Dweller. My name is Kyle. This is the story of how I lost my friend in the woods of Arizona when I was 12. Even after a search and rescue team searched for months, no one ever found anything. This story takes place 20 years ago, north of Payson. My friends Pete and Russell and I loved to camp during the summer break, and since our house was off into the woods, you didn't have to walk far off until you hit a pretty decent camping spot. One summer, we decided to camp separately to see how we'd do. I wandered far off from our usual camping spots, farther from the woods and more towards the open areas and meadows. It was the farthest from home I had ever camped in this area. Pete decided to stick in one of the spots we usually camped. And Russell? I don't know where Russell went at the time. Luckily, we had radios to communicate in case anything went wrong. We all left at 10 in the morning. Pete radioed me around midday when he reached his spot. I called in sometime around 1 p.m. We began to worry when we hadn't heard from Russell yet, but the radio cackled and announced that he had found a spot pretty late in the day. I don't remember the exact time, but it was fairly late. We set up our tents, began fires, and spent the warm summer night under a blanket of stars. Everything was rather usual up until this point. But around midnight or so, I heard my radio make strange noises. It sounded like one of the guys was trying to talk to me, but the signal was absolutely terrible. I picked up my radio to see what was up. Freaking Russell, said Pete. It's not me, it's Pete. And I couldn't hear what he was saying. Finally, Russell broke through and asked how we were doing. We said we are doing okay, but I asked why it took so long for him to find a spot. He said, I found this spot beyond those hills north of here. The only hills in the area were about a mile away, so Russell was very far out there. I thought it was weird, but Russell said the area was great, so we all went to sleep at around 1 or 2 in the morning. I awoke just before dawn to hear someone running past my camp. I thought it was Pete since he was the closest, so I unzipped my tent and looked around. The zipper got caught in the fabric several times, but I could see who was making the noise. T to my surprise, it was Russell. That was weird. I didn't see his face, only his back, but I could tell it was him by the clothing and the hair color. I called out to him something like, Go back to bed, you idiot. Or something around that. But Russell didn't stop running. He didn't even turn to look. He just booked it across the meadow. I figured he went into the woods, but it was way too dark for me to see much of anything at this time of night. I thought he was pulling a prank on me or something, so I grabbed my flashlight and looked around the tree line. There was nothing. It was way too late in the night for him to be doing this. I was tired and probably he had his radio on him, I would assume, so I tried to contact him. Russell picked up. What the heck, man? I said. What? He responded. What do you want? Liar. I said. You're running around to my camp. No, I'm not, dude. I'm still at my camp. Are you sure it's not Pete? No, it's you, man. I saw you. Stop playing games with me. Shut up and go to sleep. He said. He ended his call. I swore I saw him not once but three times that night. He wouldn't talk to me, face me, acknowledge me anytime I would yell at him. He'd just run right through camp. When dawn arrived and sunlight broke through the meadow, I contacted Pete, hoping he'd be up. Pete got no sleep that night on account of Russell as well. Pete told me Russell had run into his camp and called for him to look at something. I stopped Pete's story and told him I had head to his camp. I left my tent and everything else. I'd pick it up later. Back at Pete's camp, Pete told me that Russell said he needed help. Pete called into the woods to ask what he needed help with, but Russell would have to wait to answer. He would just repeat the first question. Pete got tired of the game and went back to sleep after some time. He called Russell shortly after but got no response. Russell denied ever being near either of the camps, explaining how long of a walk it would have taken him to get there. 
but the second time Russell was contacted, there was no response. We decided to find his camp and set this straight, so we headed towards the nearest hills. After about a mile walk, we snaked along the back side of the mountain and found footprints in the mud. We followed them quite some way, but lost them when the soil dried. After climbing a tree, we spotted a spot of red in the distance. Finally, we knew Russell's tent was red, so we were hoping that had to be it. We went in that direction and hiked an extra mile until we reached his campsite. It was secluded in a clearing deep in the woods, surrounded by juvenile pine trees. But when we reached his tent, it was absolutely ransacked. The tent was ripped into shreds, his belongings were strewn about, his radio was thrown into the long gone campfire. There was trash everywhere. We searched for Russell for hours but couldn't find anything. We decided to hike back towards the hills to view the area better. It took us some time, but we finally got a better view. And that's when we saw him. Russell was standing on top of a hill not far from us. Relief flooded our senses as we ran towards him. We stopped abruptly. Something was not right. Pete put his arm out in front of me, blocking me from running any further. Hold on, hold on, he said. I need help explaining what was wrong, but Russell wasn't Russell. He resembled Russell very closely, but the way he moved and his facial expressions were just off, and I didn't realize how screwed up it was until we were only about 30 yards from him. His body shape was weird. It was like he had drawn more of his body towards his center, leaving his arms, legs, and everything else much skinnier. When we proceeded to walk towards him, Russell began to smile at us. The smile was abnormally large. It stretched ear to ear. The thing, or Russell, whatever this was, got on all fours and started running down the hill, losing Russell's form and shifting into something we couldn't even imagine existed. Skin stretched over the creature's bony body, its head elongated with a strange circular mouth, black beady eyes, as this thing ran down the hill, it was screaming in Russell's voice, but kind of robotic. To this day, I really don't know how to explain this experience to most people, so I just keep it to myself. If anyone in the comments has any idea what this could be, what we experienced, what we saw, what happened to our friend, please let us know in the comments. The Kentucky Holler Crawler by... Tyler R. When I was 9 or 10, my uncle told me a story that has stuck with me ever since. Growing up in Kentucky, I've always heard tales of, you know, Bigfoot or the Popelik Goatman, the usual run-of-the-mill urban legend, campfire story if you will. But the story of my uncle and this weird creature he allegedly ran into has always stood out from other tall tales I had heard. Kentucky is home to the world's most extensive cave system, Mammoth Cave. Since its founding in July 1st, 1941, only about 365 miles have been surveyed by the human eye. It's believed that over 600 miles of passageways and caverns are still yet to be discovered. The national park is stretched over three counties, spanning over 50,000 acres, Edmonton, Hart, and Barron counties. My uncle has owned land in Edmonton County since the early 1980s. I remember hearing about how and when they were out there hunting for deer. They would occasionally come across pits of various sizes in the ground. They were the mouths of cave entrances. They would usually just toss a barrel or a large tree branch over it so no one would stumble across it, fall in, and become trapped. According to most people, besides wildlife or just getting lost in the woods, there wasn't much else you really had to worry about. This story takes place in the early 1990s, about five years after my uncle purchased the land. His closest neighbor, whose name is Ken, lived about a half a mile down the dirt road parallel to their properties. They naturally became good friends over time and occasionally would accompany each other when hunting. My uncle lived in Louisville and would visit his property when he had days off or needed to do upkeep, like mowing or restocking his pond. So unlike his neighbor Ken, 
he spent more than most of the year in Louisville. On this particular weekend, Ken went out hunting for deer. He left his cabin and headed off into the woods. He had done this a hundred, maybe even two hundred times before. He followed a path he had used plenty of times to a small grouping of trees overlooking a small meadow. He said it was a perfect sunny day, it was beautiful, it was fall, there were just no clouds in the sky, absolutely perfect for hunting. He sat in the shadows underneath some low-hanging tree branches, feeling hidden from what would be prey that might come by. Despite being the ideal weather for hunting, he didn't see much game, just a few fawns and doe, not the big trophy buck he was hoping for. He had been entertaining the idea of grabbing his gear and returning to the cabin. But, not wanting to go home empty-handed, he decided to stick around for just a bit longer, hoping his luck would change. His chest fluttered when he looked across the meadow to the left and saw movement in the tree line opposite him. He pulled his rifle to his shoulder and looked down at the scope. The thick trees and foliage at the end of the tree line prevented him from getting a good view at what animal was in his sight. From what he could tell, it was heading towards the edge of the woods and he just had to be patient. When it stepped out of the shadows of the trees about 50 yards away into the clearing, he almost immediately knew he wasn't looking at a deer. He tried to keep his hands from shaking, his rifle as he desperately tried to identify exactly what he was looking at. He described its body as a panther, but the upper torso were like the shoulders of like something different. He didn't really know how to explain it. He, he just said that they sat noticeably higher than its lower back and height legs. He was looking at its side profile, which he claimed, while in mid-stride, this thing would be close to at least seven feet in length. He said it was absolutely quiet, like a stalking cat. It never made a noise when it moved. The front legs, he said, were more like arms, significantly longer and skinnier than its hind legs. It had brittle, dark brown hair that started from the back of its head and ran down the length of its back. He also claimed that the creature's skin looked waxy, almost like a chimpanzee's dark brown or nearly black skin. Its face was long like a dog's, but he said he noticed no ears. He said the corners of its mouth ended by the neck, where the ears should be, it just sounded unsettling. The most weird and downright unsettling detail I can remember about this was that its back legs, he described them as being almost frog-like, as the back legs were tucked close to the creature's sides. When it walked, the leading leg would reach almost to the front of its body, and the other leg would stretch way back, flat like a frog when it crawled. He watched it for about two or three minutes, slowly and quietly moving through the long golden grass, when it walked, the leading leg would reach almost to the front of its body, and the other leg would stretch way back, flat like a frog when it crawled. He watched it for about two or three minutes, slowly and quietly moving through the long golden grass, a black shadow surrounded by color. He watched it disappear into the tree line directly across from the woods he had seen it come from initially. After a few moments, he left and headed back to his cabin in absolute disbelief. Now I don't know how long it was after this initial incident occurred that Ken told my uncle about it, but he was reluctant to speak about it. He dubbed it the Kentucky Holler Crawler. Eventually, Ken thoroughly explained the story one night while sitting around the campfire with my uncle. Ever since then, Ken refused to go into the woods. He claimed to only hunt from the dirt road running through his property afterward. Both my uncle and Ken have sadly passed away since, but their story never changed over the years. I have even had my uncle retell it multiple times, and it's the exact same details every single time. The thing that keeps me up at night, though, isn't the thought of the creature. It's the thought of where it came from. Who's to say that thing didn't crawl up from the cave, spanning hundreds of miles in every direction? Let me start by giving some background. I'm a 25-year-old man. I love the outdoors. Anything to do with camping, swimming, ice skating, anything to do with the outdoors in general is my thing. While this story takes place in a snowy tundra back on the date of 11-13-2017 in the Colorado Rocky Mountains National Park, 
my friend Jay, John, and Alyssa were going up there for a camping session, as we all have this in common now. I know, I heard the stories on this channel a million times of people going into the national parks and never returning, but this is something entirely different. We thought this was going to be a nice getaway, but it quickly turned into a hell I'll never forget. I'll always be thankful for the shotgun and the bullets I had gotten from my cousin. He makes dragon breath style type shells. For this will be important later. So, back to what we were doing. It was like any other day, traveling from Berks County, Pennsylvania, all the way up to the Rockies. As you can imagine, this was one hell of a three-day plan for us to get there. We would leave Friday and come home on a Sunday. Well, everything was good for most of the trip. You know how long rides go, staying in crappy motels and stopping and eating very sketchy gas station food. Anyways, we finally arrived at the Colorado Rocky Mountain National Forest on a day colder than most. We had the usual traveling stuff for this sort of thing, and we made sure to pack extra clothing. We wanted to make sure we were plenty warm for what Mother Nature presented us, because what she showed us that day was, to say the least, harsh climate weather. So, we began our trek into the mountains, and everything was going very well. Nothing crazy happened, except for the occasional breeze of wind until nighttime hit. We established a base camp at roughly 15 miles that day. Deep inside the Rockies, we got a fire going, and we're grilling some weenies and beans. Nothing wrong with that. Until I went to take a leak. I had this unbearable, unshakable feeling like we were not alone, and I could feel this before my foot touched the ground. I got bad vibrations instantly. The moment I was alone, I got major red flags. Me being me, I didn't want to spook my friends, so I didn't say anything and just kept a lookout. Besides, my friends weren't really big into cryptids or ghosts or anything spooky like that, so I didn't want to really kill the vibe. As moving forward into the story seems this feeling I got went away, but at the same time, it still kind of stayed close. I zipped up my pants and went back to my friend who was already getting drunk and eating. Thankfully, nothing else happened that night, so we ate and called it a night. Sometime around 2.37 a.m., I had awoken harshly in my sleep to this god-awful feeling of being watched. Like if you've ever stared at someone for so long as they joke and they turn around and then suddenly you're there. Well, that's almost the way I felt, but in the tents were just Jay, Alyssa, who were a couple, and myself. So they slept on their own side, and I was on my own. I zipped up the flap and poked my head out of my tent slowly. I was looking around and I saw nothing. Everybody else was in their tents, and honestly, it seemed that people were sleeping. I slowly crawled back into my sleeping bag, and somehow, out of the grace of God, I managed to fall back to sleep. The next day we get up, and nothing seems out of the ordinary. The sun is out, but it looked like it snowed a bit. Trying to be rational and thinking maybe I was just hearing things and we're in the mountains, it tends to snow a bit here and maybe I just heard that last night. As the day progresses though, I notice something my friends never did. It was absolutely silent all around us the entire time. And while I've been out in the woods near cougars and bears and know that when predators are around it goes quiet, this was something much different. John turns to me with a beer in his hand and somewhat getting wasted already, around noon, and he says, What's the problem, man? You seem like you've seen a monster or something. I've told them about my encounters in the past with things that I believed to be Dogman and stuff, and usually they were more cool about it, but I'm assuming the alcohol kind of made them kind of jerks. Jay and Alyssa are more sensitive to this and don't patronize me for believing in such things as they know there is no judgment for what others believe. That's what made us friends in the first place. Anyways, getting off topic, I tell him to shut up and tell him to stop being drunk. We stand in silence for a minute listening though, and eventually, he does admit that he doesn't hear anything. Alyssa breaks the ice and says, why is it so silent? I immediately tell her nothing, probably just your regular Colorado bobcat. Now, I know these things can get big, so I assure them not to worry. I brought a nice warming gift if it decided to say hello, reassuring them that my trusty old Remington 870 pump action shotgun would definitely get the job done. 
They turn around and continue the walk. Maybe if I said what I really felt, none of this would have actually happened as it did. So, we were about 50 miles inside the Colorado Mountain National Park. And it's evening time. John was drunk as a skunk. He pitched his tent poorly. What do you want from a guy getting drunk since noon? It was at least 6 o'clock when we arrived further in. John, being John, decided that they weren't going to help set up and they were just going to sleep. Which, honestly, we didn't bother him because he was sauced up and would be more useful sleeping. Me, Jay, and Alyssa unpacked and pitched our tents and established a fire to cook the cubed steak with greens and other goodies in a pot that we brought for our three-day trip. As we cook the food, I tell Jay I'm going to have a look around. I left my shotgun behind and told Jay if anything happens, point, breathe, and shoot. But be careful, she's a hot one. He'll soon realize what I meant by this. So I go on my little journey. I like to call these big walking trips, if you will. It's just something I've called them since I was a kid. I'm loving it though, because it's just me and the sun was going down just over the horizon, giving me more peace of mind. But at the same time, it got me thinking from earlier. What was with that sense of silence? Was it really some sort of big cat or bear? So now, I realize it's been an hour, and it's about to be dark out. I've been walking in a straight line for an hour. I turned around and began the trek back to camp, but I could not help this feeling of being watched the entire time. Like if I were to turn around, there would be nothing there, but you could just feel like something or someone was staring you down. I ignored the best I can and soon reached back to camp. Alyssa woke up John and John being John, winding down from the beers he had earlier, decided to say, what are you doing? Looking for a girlfriend out here or something? I laughed and said, yeah, she's real sturdy and goes timber when I make her go down. Jay laughs a bit, and so does Alyssa. John just grumbles and says, are we eating or what? Of course, the meal was ready, and it had been for about two hours. Jay and Alyssa have been waiting for me, so, like always, we dig in as a group. I was in heaven for the time being, sharing laughs with my friends and in just enjoying the food and getting away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Little did any of us know, though. That would be one of the worst nights we would ever experience. We all finish up and get ready to hit the bed. It's about 9 going on 10 p.m. And we have a long day ahead of us. We will be hiking all the way back to where we started, which would roughly take a bit to get back. So, John says he must take a pee. I say, well, go ahead. If you're looking for a bathroom, it's all around you. He tells me to shut up, and I snicker a bit. John goes off, and Jay and Alyssa are now in their tent trying to unwind. I was outside, still stoking the fire and thinking, as I usually do. I eventually stop poking the fire and look around. That feeling of being watched comes back, but intensifies as all get out. I yell for John, but I get no response. I again call out louder for John, and still get no response. I tell him to stop playing games and come back and get some rest, man. We gotta get up early. Again, I get no response. I'm starting to get freaked out now so I go and try to find him. I went in the direction that I saw him going, which was about 100 to 150 yards in. I'm yelling for him, searching everywhere, and can find absolutely nothing. I then stop and look around and observe my surroundings a bit better. I noticed once again it was dead silent, like to the point you can hear your ears ringing. I begin walking slightly in a different direction, because I see what looks like John's head peering out near a tree side. I begin saying, come on man, you're not scaring me, I've been in worse situation. Then what I see next, has me stop immediately in my tracks. There was John, he was there with what looked like an icicle sticking out of his neck. I'd say it was three feet in length if I had to guess, but I don't even know how to describe what I saw. I know this kind of damage can only be done by something strong though, something otherworldly. What could decapitate somebody and then impale them on an icicle? Now, I've listened to the Swamp Dweller show for a long time. I've heard of stories of skimwalkers and wendigos and stuff like that. But one that I heard about recently was the Washuge, and this seemed to be a perfect match. But out here, this is far away from its original territory. I'm not even sure there have ever been sightings in this area. I say I know this because I have seen some... Very interesting information from a friend who has gone up against what he believes to be a washuge in the past and lived to tell the tale. 
Of course, he has some markings on himself to prove this. And I'll have to ask if he can be polite enough to send some pictures in for you guys. I'd love to show you if they are willing. Anyways, as I looked at John's body, his throat gushed out with blood from such a deadly weapon had me shaking a bit because this wasn't some cryptid you get away from. This is one you prepare to die when you meet it. I'm trying to go over every scenario in my head. As I'm examining the body, I heard Alyssa screaming and flakes begin to form around as I ran fast, trying to get to the camp. As I get back, I finally see Jay and Alyssa totally freaked the hell out, saying they saw some sort of 13-foot looking monster staring at them from 200 yards away in the tree line. Apparently, she ran back to the camp as fast as she could because she was peeing at the time. She wasn't even that far away from the campsite. It started to snow pretty hard at that time, so I got my shotgun and made sure it was ready, and I told Alyssa to stick by Jay's side, and I gave Jay a cast iron sheet for cooking and told them to use this as a shield, and no matter what, don't break the line. He asked me about John, but I looked at him and gave him this look as to not say it out loud and get Alyssa freaked the hell out though, but I think he apparently understood me and was kind of thankful about it. As we began to get ready for a fight of our life, we tried to form a barrier like line and began to steady jog as snow began to pour down. I didn't care much for the cold. If I got what was left of my friends out of there, that was all that mattered to me. We begin our trek back to the car, but suddenly, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if you have ever had this feeling before. It's that feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach when you react before something actually happens. Well, this was me. Somehow, I pushed Jay and Alyssa over and got grazed by some sort of icicle. It was about three feet long. It was like something launched it at me, similar to how you would throw a spear or maybe shoot an arrow from a bow. My friends helped me up and I told them, here are the keys to the car, go now, don't look back and run as fast as you can. I'll be there in no time. As they were freaked the hell out, they listened to me. They were reluctant on leaving me behind, but I eventually got them to go. I distracted this thing as my friends made it to the car. So here's where things get absolutely crazy. Remember the shells I told you about? Well, I just now remembered Washuge are weak to fire. So, here it was. Me and this, what I can only assume is a Washuge, all alone for some reason. This thing really seemed to want me. After all, it saw me as the strongest, I guess. It wanted to pick me off first and let my friends go, knowing damn well it could kill them too before they made their decision to do so. The snow dies down, and I am met with this monstrosity of a creature. Like Alyssa said, this thing has to be 13 feet. That's right, but the way its body was, the way it stood there frozen like a statue only breathing from its open mouth, it was absolutely a sight to behold. If I didn't see the steam releasing from its mouth, I would think this thing was dead. Here we are, the big showdown. I put up my shotgun. The distance between me and the Washuge was at least 10 feet. We could probably reach out our hands and meet in the middle and touch. It was snowing really hard though, and it was almost impossible to see each other, even though we were barreling down on each other. I think back to John, and then think to myself, and all those other people that have gone missing in the past couple of years in this park. Was it this thing that had done it? I didn't care. All I knew is that I wanted it dead. It wasn't so much as revenge but justice in my words. As I put the gun up to shoot the Washuge, it was already on its attack, and it felt like time stood still for a few seconds. I reacted so fast I just closed my eyes and shot point blank range. I peeked my eye open to see that I got it right in the face and this thing was burning. This whole thing's body caught on fire. I stood back a bit, feeling the dragon's breath round burn the Washuge. I took another shot at it, and I got it right in the chest this time. Hearing this thing's horrific painful screech, this thing rolled over and I swear I heard it mumble something like, You'll die a horrible death. Death. and like that, the yellow-eyed pinpricks for this thing's eyes glowed but the Washuge was clearly dead. I picked myself up, saying I'm sorry to John for being an ass to him. I should have been a better friend, 
because you never know when it could be your last word. Instead of finding the negative, I should have found out why he was the way he was. But to you, sir, I hope you're somewhere better. As for my friends, they made it safe. I soon arrived. It becoming day roughly about 6.36 a.m., I got back to the car, put my shotgun in the back, got in, and didn't say anything the entire ride back. Now, I know my story might sound completely unbelievable, and I completely understand that. Even my own friends don't really want to believe it. I'd rather that than an argument, though. About a year has passed now, and I finally told Alyssa what happened after about three months. I told her what actually happened to John and how I killed the creature. Her and Jay also broke up, and she hasn't heard anything from him since. Honestly, I think it really affected us all differently. I don't know. Some days, I wonder if this thing will come find me or my friends. Honestly, I think it might be best that I cut all ties with everyone involved. And after hearing about Sam White Owl, I'm going to do my best to join these people who hunt down these beasts. So, everyone I kill will be one less to worry about. Thank you, Swamp, and hello to all the Swamp folk alike. May you be safe out there. You have no idea what's in the dark watching. After watching your videos, I was reminded about my near-death experience with what I can only assume is a skimwalker. I was about 19 years old when it happened. I decided to go on a camping trip with my friends. My friends and I seen a lot of videos about skimwalkers and collectively we like to call them pig skinny. Don't ask why. I've always believed in the pig skinny, so on this camping trip, I wanted to come prepared. I brought my night vision goggles and my handy dandy Colt 45 for protection against anything. After the first day, everything goes swell. We went to bed with zero hiccups, but at one point, I heard what sounded like footsteps outside of my tent and squeaking along with it. I figured it was probably my friends pulling a prank on me pretending to be a mouse or something like that, but it also could have been a pig skinny, shape-shifted into something, maybe a mouse. I let it go though, because it did sound silly. I wanted to toy with it at first to make sure that it wasn't actually something like that. In the morning, we all woke up and I asked if they heard anything. To no avail, nobody except for me heard the noise. All of my friends wrote it off as a mouse. Those fools. The second day was a little strange, I guess you could say. My friend Cooter, long story short but that's his nickname, suddenly disappeared while I was grilling some franks over the fire. I didn't care at first, since these dogs were top-notch, let me tell you, excellent animals. Suddenly, I heard a blood-curdling screech off into the woods. It sounded like someone or something was being murdered or screaming for whatever reason. I took my colt and my knife and told my friends I'll be back. I ran off into the woods searching for my closest friend, Cooter, but I couldn't find anything. My eyes started to itch while I was writing this, so I had to pause but now I am resuming. I started to smell blood and copper in the air. I had only heard about this in stories, but now, as I write this, I get goosebumps all over again. I ignored the smell. It's not a good idea, I know, but I ignored the smell and kept pursuing my friend who I presumed got lost trying to go pee or something. I decided to return to camp. Maybe, just maybe Cooter would return. I got back to camp to find everything gone except for the head of a funny looking deer. It had human teeth, so I kind of laughed it off and thought it was a prank or something, but I was rather distraught by the fact that all of my friends had suddenly disappeared. It was getting late. I got my $2,000 night vision goggles so that I could see in the dark. I saw silhouettes in the tree line, and they reminded me of my friends. I stood there for a second and slammed my fist down on the picnic table. What? Out of nowhere, I heard the faint of a whisper of something behind me saying, It's arrived. I then heard what sounded like someone stomping on a sheet of metal. In a flash, I turned around and unloaded my colt onto whatever was behind me. It was Cooter, but something was incredibly off about him. He had multiple bullet holes in him after I shot him, and he wasn't talking. Who could have done this to him? Fast forward three weeks. I'm back in my trailer on my own property. Me and my less intelligent brother Randy were just chilling at home. 
He was clipping my toenails and I heard something like bells ringing outside. I look out, and there my friend Cooter was. But how? I was pretty sure I had killed him with those bullets. They were massive 45 ACP rounds, and they are strong. But I guess not strong enough. He stared at me for a while, and I stared back. It felt like years, centuries, eons. Then, he walked back into the woods, and I've never seen them again. In reality, this story is kind of crazy. Because a couple of weeks later, I would actually see my friends again. And I would question them about that night. And all of them have no recollection of us ever camping. So, is what I experienced some sort of time lapse? Some sort of time loop or something, I don't know. Did this skimwalker put some sort of curse on all of us? And what did I meet? And what did I shoot? The Mocker by Elias I've kept most of this a secret to myself for some time. Hello, Swamp Dweller. My name is Elias. I'm dying to share this story with someone else. I'm from upstate Michigan. I love the outdoors and frequently hit the gym. I've got a part-time job as a janitor at a gym, and my shift is usually from 7 p.m. to 12 a.m., depending on how much cleaning is needed. This entire thing began back in 2021, sometime during August if I remember correctly. The only other janitors were busy cleaning. He was mopping, and I was wiping down the equipment. When it came time to vacuum the corners of the rooms, I was missing one of the attachments for the hose. The other janitor said the only place it could have been was the shed outside. At first I thought he was talking about the one right by the side of the building, but he told me it was the one down by the gravel path at the edge of the woods. I don't know why it would be in there. I have no idea. I took a quick jog from the gym and headed down the trail to find the attachment. I didn't bring a flashlight other than the one that was on my phone, but I figured that was all I would need. To my surprise, the shed was unlocked and the door was cracked open about six inches. Weird, I thought. But someone probably forgot to lock it. It wouldn't be the first time, you know. And some wind blew it open. It happened all the time at my house. I whistled as I walked in, poking around for the attachment. I stopped abruptly to listen for if I could hear anything coming out of the shed because I swear I might have heard something. I quit my search and left the shed. I looked both ways and there was nothing, but I could hear whistling coming from the woods that sounded just like what I was doing. They were long, low whistles, but they sounded pretty human to me. And there wasn't anyone out here. Hello? Anybody out there? I shouted, thinking the other janitor was looking for someone or something. A voice answered back. Hello? Elias? It was the janitor's voice. I thought he was trying to be funny, so I laughed and said, Maybe if you didn't have so much junk in here, I could find the darn attachment. The voice trailed off. I caught the words, Find the darn attachment. End of echoing. He spoke up and said again, Ready to start the night? I, I needed clarification. What was he talking about? 7 to 12 is the real gym shift, buddy. He said. Now, things were bizarre. I had heard him say those exact words when we walked in to start the shift. Those exact words. Why was he repeating them? He continued. Couldn't find the darn attachment. Something wasn't right. It was like it was practicing and trying to get more natural sounding. I looked back toward the building, which was still lit up. Through the window, I could make out someone moving around in there. It had to be the other janitor, I thought. That's when I knew something was awfully wrong. I slowly backpedaled from the shed, listening to the janitor's voice saying the exact phrases repeatedly. When I was about halfway back to the gym, I noticed something coming out of the woods and stopping just before the tree line. Whatever it was, it was tall. It was hard to tell much about it since it was really dark outside, but I had to say it had to be like seven feet tall. It had a muscular, slender body and glowing white eyes. I could hear it panting heavily. Once I saw this, I hightailed it out of there and locked the gym door behind me. I told the janitor about it. He said that he had seen it and heard it before, and he called it the mocker. He explained that it would repeat things, human things that they would say, 
around the woods. He also said you'd be fine if you didn't stick around after hearing it. But I wasn't so sure. I never saw that thing again, and I've never really heard much about it. I've listened to Skimwalker stories, Wendigo stories, but I don't think it was that. Those are similar, but this just feels completely different at the same time. Please, let me know if you guys have any ideas of what this thing might be. I encountered something strange by Annie B. Hello and happy holidays, and thank you for sharing this story if you decide to, Swamp Dweller. I hope all is well. I wanted to write you today because I trust you, and I trust telling you about my encounter. It's difficult to talk about, but I'm grateful to you. I got the courage to tell my story because I was listening to a video of yours, and someone else had an experience very similar to mine, and I can't tell you the relief that flooded into me knowing I was not alone. I have searched for over 30 years to find another encounter similar to mine. I reached out to the person in the story in the comments of your video, and we were able to connect and discuss our encounters. It was such a weight to know I wasn't the only one to experience something like this. At the time, I was 11 years old, and it happened in New Hampshire. I don't know if you remember, but in one of your videos you were talking about someone's encounter that was from New Hampshire, and they mentioned that they could tell it was going to be a bad night because things felt off, and it just felt heavy, and you just knew something was not right. Well, I can attest that that was an accurate statement. We had a cabin on a lake in New Hampshire. It was a very rural area, and there were a few neighbors around. It was just a very secluded area with not much going on, and I spent every summer there from when I was about three to about 18 years old. You knew when you would have a bad night because there was just a heaviness in the air, and you felt washed no matter where you were, and it was always like there was this hushed but scrutinizing feeling in the woods all around. The day of my encounter was one of those days, but I was a kid and I just went and did my thing. My grandmother was very on edge. Where my cabin was, we were built on a little hill, and at the end of the hill was a small dirt road, and on the other side of the road was our lake and I guess you could say beach. So my front yard was rather big. The side yards were well sized, and the backyard was probably about 10 to 15 feet of grass. Where the grass stopped, the white mountains began. It was the flat grass of our backyard and then the mountains. It was notable for a kid. I could get up and swim, run around the mountains, or play in the yard. It was a paradise for a kid who liked to be out in nature. This day, though, I remember my grandmother being very on edge and telling me to stay away from the back and side yards, and she only wanted me playing in the front yard or by the lake where she had direct eyesight of me. I of course said okay, I was in the yard and I was playing, and felt like I was being watched. I didn't like how uneasy I felt, so I wound up going inside and reading a book even though it was a gorgeous day out. I remember my grandmother telling my mom not to cook on the grill that night because she had been having a bad day. She felt that there was something foreboding coming, and my mom listened because my grandmother grew up in the woods of Maine. She was pretty superstitious, I'll grant you that, but she knew something. She always knew when something was off. The cabin was set up when you walked in. The living room was to your left, the dining room to your right, and all the bedrooms were off the living room. My parents' bedroom, then my grandparents, and then mine. My room had a door that went outside. On hot nights, I would latch the screen door that was on the outside and leave the door itself open. That way I could get a nice breeze, and that's what I did that night. I remember that it was so quiet, absolutely unsettlingly quiet. But I still managed to fall asleep after some time. I don't know what woke me up, but when I woke up, I looked out the screen door and saw this huge wolf that was pure white, and I remember not being afraid of it per se. I almost instinctually knew it wasn't there to hurt me, but maybe to even protect me. I know this sounds crazy. Believe me, if it had not happened to me, I don't know what I would be believing if anybody told me this. The wolf never spoke to me telepathically as in other people's encounters. Still, I often wonder if it was manipulating my emotions or actions for lack of a better word. 
because I knew it didn't want to hurt me, and it wanted me to go outside with it. I don't know how I knew, but I did. So I got out of bed, went outside, and sat next to it on the stairs. Now, I was up three stairs, and it was still probably three to four feet taller than I was. It was the most beautiful animal I had ever seen, pure white with gorgeous crystal eyes. I just started talking to it and petting it. It kind of leaned in to me as I was doing this, and again there was not one ounce of fear or hesitation within me, which was odd because while I love animals, I always was taught to give wild animals a wide berth because, well, they're wild. You don't know how they will react. Maybe they'll hurt you, maybe they won't, but I had no such hesitation with this animal. We sat together, me petting it, talking to it, and leaning on it for probably 15 minutes. I heard branches snapping and something walking and getting closer in the woods just off of my yard. That's when I knew the wolf didn't want me outside anymore. Again, I don't know how I knew this, I just did. It wanted me to go back in and lock the door so I would be safe. So, I did, and it waited until I closed the door. It flew into those woods like a bat out of hell the moment I did, and I heard fighting, growling, and I swear I heard a and I swear I heard a scream that was blood chilling. I had never heard anything even close to that since or before. It was high and low pitch at the same time. It was terrifying. I don't know what was in those woods that night, but I know that wolf was there to protect me. I don't know why or how it came to be there, but it was. Like I said at the beginning of this letter, I had spent over 30 years trying to find an encounter similar to mine or a legend, something to prove I was not insane. As I was listening to one of your videos, and someone from Maine described almost an identical experience, it felt like a weight had been lifted. As I said, I didn't see what was in the woods that night, but I have my suspicions that it protected me from a Wendigo or something similar. As in the other person's story, I believe that that was what was watching him as well. New England is Wendigo territory, and I found a legend from the Alaskan Canadian indigenous tribes in my research. It speaks of a white wolf that would protect the tribes against the Wendigo. I could be wrong, of course, and I can't say for sure that's what was out there, but that's what I think happened. Thank you for taking the time to read about my encounter and reading other people's experiences. I am sure I'm not the first person who has recognized their own experience in one of yours and felt relief that they weren't the only one. This was during the end of 2020. We were still in somewhat of a lockdown in Southern California. A lot of hiking trails were closed off to the public. My mom and her friend Stephanie are avid hikers. My mom and her friend decided they would go hiking on this closed trail. They had met someone who said they could use their backyard anytime they wanted to access the trail. So thus they did. It's a downhill hike to a watering hole and an uphill hike back up. They took off later in the day, intent, and started their descent. They came across a young man reading as they are a few minutes out from the watering hole. Thinking nothing of it, they get to the watering hole and try to enjoy their time. Eventually they start hiking back up because they realize it's starting to get dark and they have a solid 3 or 4 miles back up the hill. They start to experience what sounds like strange rustling noises in the bushes. My mom self-proclaimed herself as an idiot for checking out the brush, which growled back at her. So, they got the heck out of there. As they're walking, they hear what sounds like some sort of gentleman start yelling out to them. Help! I'm lost! Can you shine your light? I don't know how to get out of here! My mom and Steph think it could be the guy they saw earlier. Maybe he got lost. My mom, as I said, is a self-proclaimed idiot. She shines her flashlight through the darkness, and they see a man sprinting at them. It wasn't a jog, she told me. It was a deliberate sprint. He was dashing down a slope at them, and it was hard to explain their positioning. They were on top of a hill, and he was on top of a pitch in the woods across from them. And it was not the man they saw earlier. Steph tells my mom she needs to turn off her light, and they need to get out of there. When my mom turns off the light, he starts cursing expletives to himself directed at them. They quickly hike in the darkness, refusing to turn on their lights. After about 15 to 20 minutes, my mom thinks it must be okay for them to turn the flashlight on. Nope. The second she turns on her flashlight, they hear him again, 
that I see you guys. Please wait for me. I need your help. I'm coming. They run the rest of the trail in the darkness, get back to the car, and dip out of there. I'll never forget when my mom told me this and explained the chains of voice when she turned off her flashlight and how she explained him sprinting at them. This might not be the most scary story ever sent into the show, but thank you for sharing it. I don't know how to start this story, but it happened only an hour ago, and I'm still absolutely spooked. So this is a bit of a preface. My friend and I are home alone now, and we have been for a few hours. Every time he comes over, we go to the woods by my house, and it's ordinarily uneventful. But, some throwing rocks and breaking trees and stuff, harmless fun. But this time, something else happened. As I said, we're home alone, and have been for quite some time. And while this happened, we were home alone. We went outside to go to the woods, and the trip was uneventful for a minute. But once we actually got in there, something, something just felt off. Everything was dark, tons of trees had been knocked down, and the whole place looked completely different, like somebody had rampaged through the area. We kept going in, still having our usual harmless fun, and at one point, my friend turned to me and said we should go back. I looked at my phone and decided it had only been 30 minutes, so we might as well stay a bit longer because it'll be a few hours until anyone would want us to be home. We continued finding a few strange things, like an old crushed Mountain Dew can, probably 10 to 20 years old, a toy boat that had been destroyed by the wind and water, and other things that probably were even older than that can. We planned to go further than I had ever been into those woods before, which isn't very hard because I've barely been that deep. After walking for a while, we came to a landmark I knew of that marked the deepest that I had ever been. Some time ago, when I was going far into the woods, I came upon a bridge built on a log that fell over into the river in the middle of the woods. However, one thing was different this time. Something was sitting on top of it. Whatever it was was small and resembled the head of an animal. When we got closer to get a good view of it, it was a deer skull, pearly white and clean, sitting on the bridge, with no clue as to who put it there and why or where the rest of it was. Behind the river was a massive hill with a creepy small house on it, and while we were looking around, I heard a creak or something high-pitched coming towards us. Freaking out, I began to run, and from behind me, I heard my friend scream and I heard him running. We both kept running, and once we reached the edge of the woods, we stopped onto the road. I asked him why he screamed and he said he heard footsteps next to him. We quickly made our way home. The garage door was open when we got there. Not knowing if it was left open or not, we ran inside, locking the doors, checking the house, and turning the alarm on. This is still one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. I don't know what was out there in the woods with us that night, if that deer skull and house has anything to do with it, but it was downright scary. I live right next to a Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We hang out, play games, and we're just ordinary teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and usually only takes me about 30 minutes or so. I've made this trip dozens of times and have become very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest, however, about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There was always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence, so I tried to ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. On this day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was about 10 to 15 steps in when I heard a tree branch snap. You know the sound that screams there is someone or something there with you? I froze, not sure of what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back at my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation. I whispered, hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips. I don't even know why I opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. 
anything at all. My heart sank when the answer came back in the same sound of my own voice, but distorted. Hello? I started to breathe too fast. My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I would faint at any moment. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted, I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I could not make myself scream. I couldn't reply as my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I could not pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated, stop it! I finally managed to tear it from my lips and everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale and I realized for the first time that there were no typical forest sounds. No bugs, no frogs, no crickets, nothing at all. I stood there, terrifying, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it. It mimicked back. Somehow, I had had enough and was willing my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard a rustling in the bushes 20 feet to my left. I watched in horror as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush. I took off as it came out and stood up on two legs. I flew out of those woods and got home in record time. When I got there, I said nothing to my mother. I went straight to my room, laid down, and thought about what had just happened. My mother came in at some point and asked me if everything was okay. I replied that yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I might have been afraid of how she would react, I guessed. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and said that no matter what happened that night, do not reply or look out my window. This terrified me even more. He said to call him the following day and he would explain more, and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I could not fall asleep at all. I mean, could you blame me? I stayed awake, listening to every little sound that night brought. Sometime around 3am, just as I was about to drift off to sleep, the air noticeably changed, and the night sounds quieted. I felt my heart begin to pound. I laid there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child far too scared to move. It came after a silent moment. It was all too long. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it. it mocked what I had repeated in the woods earlier. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said, but then it did something new. It called my name. It called my name in my mother's voice. It just kept repeating, Amy, Amy come here, and then repeating those same phrases over and over. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeatedly repeated what I said in the woods. In the morning, it finally stopped when the sun broke through the dark. I fell into a fitful sleep. I woke up around midday to my friend calling me and telling me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain exactly what was going on. He said there were creatures out there called flesh gates or potentially even a skimwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into animals and other beings. It somehow caught my scent and knew me. It was attached to me, cursing me, if you will. I was also given a warning that since it knew me now, it would always follow me, that I would always have to be careful. Last night I heard scratching on my window, then a low hum. The creature began repeating my name and adding things I hadn't heard yet, again in my mother's voice. At one point it started calling my name but drawing it out far too long. It tried to get me outside or to open the door or to let it in my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Will it stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can honestly handle that. I am a 23-year-old woman, half Cherokee from Georgia. When this happened, my fiance and I lived on a large farm in Maryland. We didn't use the farm, but we rented a small house on the property, and we were free to come and go around the grounds. I was only 19 at the time this took place, and the only residents in our home were myself, my fiancé, and our cat and dog. Our cat was a lunatic barn cat that I had rescued because I can't say no to animals that need help, and our loyal pit bull, a sweet, cuddly, scaredy cat. She weighed about 75 pounds and was afraid of her own shadow. Our farm was situated on approximately 20 acres of land and our driveway was nearly a half a mile long. 
So usually when I would get home from work, my loyal dog and I would go for a walk and usually I brought my fiance with me. Not that I was afraid to go out alone, just that he spends too much time playing video games and anything to get him to use his legs is good. After our driveway was a 12 mile long road through the woods and farms until it finally reconnected with civilization. So it was safe to say that we were far from other people except from our landlord. The first mile or so were through an open farmland, followed by a brief patch of forest, and then about a half a mile or so of wheat fields, and then solid forest for another couple of miles. Now that you have a bit of information on the layout, on to the creepy part. So it started like any other weekday evening. My fiance and I returned home from our work to our comfortable cottage and pets. Harley, our dog, was frantic to go for a walk. So I quieted her, changed into my walking clothes, and asked if the fiancé would join me. He had gotten home shortly after me and said he had seen one of those coyotes out near our house, and didn't think it was a good idea tonight. Still, as you may know, coyotes are primarily scavengers, especially out here on the East Coast. So I was not too worried, and I am very capable of defending myself. I called him a puss and told Harley we would go and be fine without him. Laughing to myself, we left the cottage and started walking toward the driveway. The sun was going down, the October air had begun to get a chill, and it rustled through the cornfields next to our long driveway. The corn was about six feet tall at this point in the year and impossible to see through. So I assumed that my fiancé was trying to scare me because there's no way he could have seen a coyote in this field. Harley was enjoying her time in the area tearing in and out of the corn stalks on our walk up the driveway and I knew that she was a big coward, so she would definitely alert me to any danger very quickly by running away. By the time I reached the end of the driveway, the sun had set and the moon which had already come out was shining high about the fields. It wasn't quite complete, but it provided enough light that I didn't need to use my flashlight or Harley's collar light. We turned left down the road and proceeded across the first section of the field. This first field was soybeans, if you don't know, they are relatively short plants that nothing but a rabbit could hide in. Off in the distance, I spotted a few deer, but nothing alarming. So we relaxed and enjoyed our walk through the night air. I threw a stick and Harley brought it back repeatedly. Typical dog and owner stuff. We reached the first small section of trees and Harley stopped and bumped into my leg, letting me know there was something ahead. It wasn't a coyote or a deer, but a rabbit that had been hit by a passing car that was still struggling to survive. As much as I hate to say this, there was no way it was going to live, and honestly, it was probably what drew the coyotes in. I knelt by it and used my knife quickly to put it out of its misery, as my family had taught me to do, and let it pass into the next life. Feeling sad but somewhat relieved that we had only encountered a handful of deer and that poor rabbit, we continued our walk and passed into the following field. This was a wheat field, and the wheat was about ready for harvest, so it was tall and hard to see. The area was quiet, though, and Harley didn't do anything, so I figured the coyotes had passed on if there had been any. Now this is the part you have been waiting for, and I don't know what it was, but here it is. We rounded the corner of the field and into the area with wheat on our left and a forest on our right. The air seemed to go still, almost like it was stale. Harley got closer to me, and I heard rustling in the wheat field. I saw three tails circling back toward the forest. Coyotes, I thought. The eastern coyotes are small, but in a pack, they can get pretty ballsy. Harley raised her heckles, and I yelled, Get out of here! Go! Bugger off! As loud as I could, and the coyotes started scattering off into the trees. I decided to turn around and get out of there before they regroup because I am brave, but I am not going to walk into a dark forest with a coyote pack and a cowardly pit bull. We turned back and again I heard a rustling in the wheat. A confused coyote, maybe? I thought it must be, but no. Harley was standing stock still staring at the grain and I whistled for her to come with me. That high-pitched, ear-piercing, two-fingered whistle. That snapped her out of it for a split second, when my whistle was returned from the inside of the wheat. Suddenly, all the family legends I had heard came flooding back to me, and I expected to see a tall, thin creature emerge but nothing did. It didn't smell rotting. It didn't smell bad. I just had this sense of dread. I was transfixed with fear and curiosity. I whistled again, and the whistle was then returned once more. Very human sounding, but at the same time, not. Against my better judgment, I swear, 
I said something. I don't remember what I said, but it repeated it back to me. There was no bugs, no coyotes, no Harley noises, just my breath. Slowly, the rustling started again, and I turned on my flashlight. I shined it on the wheat field, and what I saw still confuses me to this very day. Animal eyes. They were green, with like a yellow hue in the reflection. But what they were connected to made no sense. There was a little girl, no more than 14 or 16 years old, crouched in the wheat. She wore what I think must have been deer skin or fur, and she was naked otherwise. She was skinny and looked like her skin had never seen sunlight before. Her hair was long and tangled with wheat and leaves. Under any other circumstances, I would have said she was beautiful, but at that moment she was terrifying. We stared at each other for what must have been a solid minute or so, but felt like much longer until I heard the unmistakable coyote howl from the forest. Both of our heads snapped toward the noise, and immediately, I heard her take off through the wheat toward the sound. At that moment, Harley took off toward the house, and I went after her. We didn't stop running until we got to the driveway, and I stopped, not wanting my fiancé to know I was running away from something. I could still hear the howling in the distance, and we started walking back at a brisk pace. We made it back to the cottage with no further problems, and I didn't tell my fiancé about it. Not wanting him to go out there with a the gun, she hadn't hurt me, and so I didn't think it was right to hunt her. I was awoken in the middle of the night by the sound of coyotes outside of our cottage. This wasn't usual, but now I wondered if she was with them. When I was coming home from work about a month later, I had stopped obsessing about that night, and I almost thought I had imagined it when I slammed on my brakes. I saw something in the road. It was dark, and when my headlights hit it, the eyes reflected green and yellow. It was a large coyote. I stared at it very briefly, and then it ran into the woods. I know this sounds crazy, but I still wonder if that was her. The Creature from the Ritual by Braxton P. Hi, Swamp Dweller. It's been about a month since I last sent in a story about some unusual experiences I've been having. Recently, I've been having crazier things happen on my property. I live in one of the most secluded areas in Georgia. It's nice and private settling on a few thousand acres with about a 250-acre lake and no neighbors except the local wildlife. It's been family-owned since 1810, as houses have been built and rebuilt. I have had to do further research to discover why these experiences are happening to me and my family. It always appears safe during the daytime, but becomes incredibly different when night comes. During my research, I discovered this property was once a hideout for a local Cherokee tribe. Occasionally, I hear knocking on wood, knocking on the house, possible rocks being thrown below the windows, and so on. My last experience was just last night when the sun was almost out of sight. Coyotes just started becoming more active. I hear them howling and the birds are always whistling. It came to a point when all the animals suddenly went quiet and the only thing I heard was footsteps crunching on leaves. There are no bears in this area of Georgia, but whatever it was, it was huge, and our giant animal is usually a deer. This is central Georgia, not too far south of Lake Sinclair. We don't really have alligators either. I could scratch off every possible animal because those footsteps were massive. You would know it was much louder than any known animal if you heard them, like an elephant walking through. The footsteps finally stopped about 30 yards into the thick woods. The next thing I hear is what sounded like some kind of gibberish ritual, but it wasn't quite in words. I had never heard anything like this before. Even my wife heard it and we were both on the upper back porch. We liked to sit down and enjoy the sun setting to the west side of the lake, but it was already completely dark when we heard this thing speaking in what I could only assume was tongues. I tried using a battery-powered spotlight to see where this thing was, but with no success, as it kept saying something over and over. The next thing I know, something was thrown towards us, landing on the porch. 
It was about two to three pounds. It was a rock, and it was pretty big. I picked it up carefully and placed it on a small sandwich bag. It might have been... It might have had some sort of fingerprint evidence, I don't know. I turned it over to professionals to get a good look at it, but I don't think anything really ever came of it. I know it might sound weird to do that, but I need to find out what's going on here and what this creature is. Earlier this morning, I began searching for professionals and only found something called cryptozoologist. Since no other known studies are based on this experience, I never told my daughters or my family about this because they wouldn't understand. My daughters are only five years old, and I don't want them to be traumatized by this. When cryptozoology appeared on my computer, it talked about the legendary Bigfoot, their biggest passion, and a few others known as cryptids. I'm hoping to go into the woods with my wife tomorrow to see if I can find any fingerprints, and I would love to share some pics with you if we can get anything on camera. The Weirdest Halloween Ever by Pample Moose Here in England, we don't do Halloween like you do in the United States. At least we don't in Bolton, a sub-district of Manchester. A few children dressed in bin bag capes with witches' hats on or a skeleton mask will knock on your door, holding up little pumpkin buckets out for sweets and some neighbors will put out some sort of paper gravestones in their windows. You know, they, they go a little bit with it, but that's about it. Last October 31st, 2022, however, the weirdest thing happened at our home. Our family were all sitting at the front of the TV watching the Exorcist movie when a hammer was at the back door. We all stopped and looked at it, and then looked at each other. To knock at the back door, you would have had to got through a wrought iron side gate which is always firmly locked. The knocking continued, getting louder and more urgent. My grandson, who was 15, got up and went to the kitchen window to investigate. I heard a stifled gasp and went to join him to see what was happening. Despite being a teenager, he is 6 feet tall and does boxing training, so he's no real little weakling. I joined him at the window and asked what was the matter. Face pale and confused, he said a massive bird-like creature had crawled along the lawn and crept into the corner of the garden near the back fencing. He was visibly shaken. The car park to a country park nature trail is at the back of our fence, so I immediately thought some local kids were having a Halloween joke and jumped the wall. Despite it being eight feet high, I thought maybe they were just pranking us. I told my grandson to tell the rest of the family what we had seen, and I told him I would check it out. He panicked, and I heard him shout to the rest of them still watching TV, he was shaken up at the crawling creature he had thought he had seen, truly. I grabbed a torch and went out into the garden. We have a lot of mature trees, shrubs, and bushes, and at the corner of the garden, I heard a rustling. I pointed the torch toward the noise and walked towards it. There, with its back against the fence, was a bird-like creature about the size of a small child. It was perched on a grassy mound with eagle-like talons for feet, a smooth body, outstretched wings, and a pointy face that resembled a giant rat. I was confused and walked towards it while it looked at me, with its head downwards but eyes looking up at me. It spread its wings and they fluttered like a bird when it was ready to take off. Then there was a prolonged hissing sound. I stopped and looked behind me for backup. I saw a few family members coming out into the garden. The thing gave one last hiss, rose into the air, looking more like a gargoyle than a bird at this point, and disappeared over the fence. It made some of the shrubs waver as it went. My grandson and I described what we had seen, but the rest of them laughed and said it was just our imagination. They admitted to seeing the shrub swaying, but they put it down to a giant kestrel or something. They didn't believe a word of it. To this day, I do not go into the back garden after dark. That was not a local kid enjoying a Halloween prank nor was it a visiting kestrel. It looked like a church gargoyle. It's never been back, and I don't want it to return. So this year, if there's a knocking at our back door, my husband or son can investigate this time. I prefer lavender and lilac in my garden over cryptic creatures. 
Visions of Death by Sam This story takes place when I was 16 years old. I had just been dropped off at school and I was going to the cafeteria. I went to sit with my best friend, Jack. When I looked at Jack, I saw this creature that resembled a person but was covered in darkness. It had no face or discernible features. He was standing right behind him with his hands on his shoulder, not forcefully, but just like resting. Its head then turned to me and followed me as I approached him. He asked me why I looked so spooked. I told him nothing because he didn't believe in the paranormal. He was a firm Christian, so anything I would have said, he would have just called me crazy. We went throughout the day and every time I saw him, it was right there with his hands on his shoulder. When I got home, I asked my mom what it could be or if my great-grandma might know. My mom told me she calls them reapers. They're not necessarily malicious or anything, they just comfort those who are going to die. I broke into tears after hearing this and ran to my room. I ended up passing out and while I was asleep I had a dream of my friend's point of view. He was in our friend's Todd's vehicle and he looked like he was listening to a speaker in the back seat, not buckled in. Todd crashed into a tree, Jack went through the windshield and snapped his neck, and then I woke up screaming. My mom and sister came in to see if I was okay. I said I was fine and I just had a bad dream. Nothing to worry about. The next day was a Friday and the Reaper followed Jack. I told Jack about my dream thinking maybe I could warn him about what would happen, but I thought he would just call me crazy. The Reaper looked at me and shook its head. I wonder why it did this. Maybe it was telling me that I couldn't or shouldn't interfere. I ignored that it, it was there for the rest of the day and, and went about my business until around 5 p.m. My friend called me and asked if I wanted to go to a party. I said, yeah, just come get me and we'll go. He told me he had a ride and Todd would be there. I screamed at him, no, don't get in Todd's truck. He told me to chill. He said he was on the way and hung up. So I went on my way to the front porch for him, hoping that my dream wouldn't be real. But after an hour of waiting, my mom got a call and told me what I hoped not to hear. He had died to basically the exact same play-by-play -play I saw in my dream. I turned around and the Reaper was standing in front of me. It put a hand on my shoulder. I screamed at it to leave me alone, and it just disappeared just as it appeared. I don't know what happened. My dream came true, and it's something I'll always scratch my head about. I don't know what that creature was, if it really was a reaper, quote-unquote, or some sort of, like, afterlife messenger, I don't know. But I don't want to find out. Good evening, and thank you for sharing my story. This encounter still troubles me to this day. It was the summer of 2011. I recently had turned 12 and my family thought it would be a great summer for a cabin trip. Normally, I would have been attending some sort of Boy Scout camp. Since we are from Florida, we drove north to South Carolina with my grandparents coming down from Canada to meet us. The cabin itself was beautiful, with a great view of the lake and its own beachhead. When we first arrived, I was first out of the car and running around in excitement. I was greeted by a man looking to be in his late fifties, the cabin owner. He smiled at me with happiness, which slowly grew into a nervous grin. Finding it quite odd and being a shy kid, I moved along. As I searched around the area being curious and wanting to see everything, I noticed almost a circular pit under the house. It was off-putting, but it didn't seem to bother me. Finally, I noticed a treehouse that the owner was building on the beach. As I ran to it, he yelled out, Watch yourself, son. It's still dangerous. I steamed onwards and climbed up the ladder. The man was correct as the top there were so many nails poking out all around. But since I was small, I found a place to stand and gaze back at the cabin. The wood cabin seems old but sturdy with a big porch and outside storage underneath, where once again, I stared at the circular pit, which now had my full attention. It was nothing that I've ever seen before and I don't think I've seen something like it since. I love the woods, and would like to say I am experienced, 
but it almost looked like a big spinning ball was dipped into the earth. I pointed it out to my father and the owner who was talking. The owner responded with, There used to be a bear that nested there, but don't worry, he's long gone. I didn't like his answer, because it seemed strange for how it looked. I brushed it off and went into the cabin, picking up one of the bunk beds before my siblings could. The first few nights were amazing. Lots of hiking and swimming and everyday things that you would do, because we knew when our grandparents arrived, we would be hanging out most of the time. When they did arrive, we sat by the fire at night and enjoyed animal watching. It's important to note the area's geography at this point. The front of the cabin faced a wide strip of dirt leading to the beach with thick trees on either side. To the left of the cabin was the dirt road we used to get to it. Behind and on the left of the cabin were thick, dense woods with a steep slope. Now, it was the seventh night that we were there. I was awoken up by weird sounds outside. Dirt shifting under weight to the left side of the cabin. The trash bins were there next to the door from the kitchen. I heard something pushing them around. Thinking it was most likely raccoons or some sort of interested animal, I should do my Boy Scout duty and shoot them off. I dropped down from my bunk and the noises went silent. I noticed a few rays of sunlight were streaking through the air. I walked over to the kitchen to look out the window, but before I could reach it, suddenly, these long, scratching noises were coming out from against the walls of the cabin. It sounded like long nails digging deep into the sheets of a bed. Terrified at this point, I slowly back away. Then a bang shook the door and I jumped. Since it was only me, my brother, and my dog who were downstairs, we were the only ones who heard it. Instantly, my dog sprinted to the door barking and growling viciously like he was about to fight to the death. This woke up my brother who panicked and grabbed me and pulled out his hunting knife. He looked down at me with reassurance and told me to get to my parents' room. He then pushed me upwards towards the stairs and ran to the door and opened it. He then went away with my dog, the barks and running getting distance as I ran upstairs, and I woke up my father. He ran out into the forest with his Colt 45. About 30 minutes later, they both came back, including my dog who was limping. I've never seen my brother with the look he had on his face before that day, and he never had that look ever again. He's typically a very brave and capable older brother, and seeing him like that unnerved me to my bone. He was an Eagle Scout, and I was a Boy Scout. We had been in the woods, and we weren't really scared to get dirty. My dog had a stick through his front left leg, but he's a good strong boy and took it like a champ. My mother and grandmother quickly drove our animal over to the local vet. While they were gone, my father grandfather and oldest second brother and I looked around the cabin for evidence of this strange event. I was still incredibly nervous, so I kept close to the cabin and my father. The trash bins had gashed holes in them, almost like they had been punched open, and the wall above had deep claw marks in it, which standing from the level of the trash bins was about six feet into the air. That's when I noticed a smell, an odd smell that wasn't coming from the trash cans. I slowly crouched down between peering underneath the cabin and where this strange pit was. There was a dead fox, shredded into literal pieces. I told my father, and him and my brother quickly cleaned it up by using a shovel and tossing it into a bag and then into the trash. My dad contacted the owner who assured us that there was nothing to be worried about, but brought us a flare gun and bear mace. A couple of days go by, and my parents take everyone to a restaurant aside from myself my oldest brother who chased the perpetrator, and my injured but stable dog. An hour after they left, I looked out the second floor window in the direction where my brother ran a few nights prior. I was petting my dog at the same time. That's when the main encounter took place. My dog raised his head alert and sniffed the air. I glanced out the window and noticed this huge bear-like creature high up in one of the trees. It was smashing my level and was staring at me. I say bear-like because it had human-like features, instead of the fat, round body bears usually have. Their body was toned, sharp, and muscular. The eyes were the worst part. They were piercing. They were yellow, almost like 
perfect human eyes at locked eye contact with me. Fear flooded my brain and forced me into a fight or flight mindset. My dog picking up on this started growling and howling at the window. I turned to run into the room and looked back at the creature who was now rapidly descending the tree, using its clawed hand to climb. I sprinted to my brother's room in tears yelling about this beast that I just saw. My brother looked at me with worried eyes and said, This territory doesn't belong to us. Then he got out of his bed, grabbed his knife and baseball bat, and walked downstairs. I armed myself with a flare gun and bear mace and prepared myself for the possibility of this thing breaking in and attacking us. A great slam into the back of the wall knocked the cabin around and made it rock like a boat and sent my dog into a frenzy. Between the growls and barks, I could hear heavy breathing from outside and things being thrown at the cabin. A rock broke one of the front windows and striking my left leg. I turned and fired the flare gun out of the window which was followed by many profanities and yelling. After this, it all stopped. My dog was still growling and pointing at the corner of the room. There was no window facing that direction so I couldn't see, but I could assume it was right there. A few minutes of silence went by when my brother and I decided to call the police and our parents. Then being idiots, we walked out of the front door and slowly walked around to the right side of the cabin. We started to hear a slow snarl coming from behind a bush, and my dog inside started going ballistic and jumping at the door. My brother started yelling at this creature and threw his baseball bat towards the bush, striking it. It sounded like it hit a tree, but we both know that we hit the creature because it let out a pained grunt. The black furry mass sprung out from behind the bush and bolted down the dirt road and we quickly lost sight of it. We hurried back inside the cabin, barricaded the doors and ran upstairs. We heard gunshots ring out moments later, and my father's truck pulls in. I fly downstairs and open the door. The rest of my family ran inside, and my father claimed a huge bear ran down the road, and he fired a couple of rounds at it. The police eventually came after having a hard time finding the cabin. We gave them the story about this aggressive bear attacking the cabin. We left that night, and my family likes to recall the story of how myself and my oldest brother fended off a hungry bear. But for me and my brother. That was not the case. When we arrived back in Florida, I went straight to my room still shaken up by what happened. When my brother came in, he looked me dead in the eyes and said, It looked human, didn't it? I just nodded and asked him about his territory remark when he looked down and responded, Every animal has its territory and usually can keep it until something bigger comes along and takes it. Well, something bigger came and it took its own territory. What he said still makes me wonder to this day. It's burned into my mind. Looking back on it, the owner was so shaky around me almost like he knew there was more danger in the area than he was letting on, and that he knew that we would be a target. This happened to me when I was a teenager. I think it was in the spring of 1998 when I was 14 years old. My Boy Scout troop went hiking in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee, and the boys in my troop were people I would known my entire life. We were all very close and knew each other very, very well, and trusted each other. We had been hiking for five days or so at this point, and it was pretty miserable. It rained every single day, and we were all exhausted and sore, and hungry. We were covered with blisters and anything else you can imagine. The adults realized we had bitten off a bit more than we could chew in trying to do a 60 mile trail, especially with the awful weather. So we changed course and had gotten off trail to spend the night in a drive-in campground, the kind of place with hookups for RVs and picnic tables and fire pits and such. There's also a central bathhouse with showers and toilets. It was in a very remote area, far from a town or any other house. There may have been a few other small groups there, but if there were, we never interacted with them or saw any of them. We were all filthy and wet and thus very excited about taking a hot shower. It was dark and we had finished dinner. A group of five of my friends, including myself and my friend Jeremy, who like everyone else in our group we had known since we were babies, headed up to the bathhouse, which was maybe a quarter mile walk through the pitch dark woods, up a worn down gravel walking trail. 
I stayed behind the cleanup and about 10 or 15 minutes later, I followed them by myself. I had a weak little flashlight, the old incandescent kind, pre-LED. I remember the woods were totally silent. When I got about halfway to the bathhouse, I could see the light from it off in the distance through the woods. I heard a noise from my left. I looked over and saw my friend Jeremy standing by an old school manual water pump about 20 feet off the trail. The kind of pump where you raise and lower a handle to pump up water from a well. There was a strange light behind him. Like the moon had come out from behind the clouds. I was startled to see him there by himself in the woods off the trail. I asked him if he was already done with the shower. He seemed kind of, uh, sad. He said, yeah, it's all yours. I said okay and didn't think much of it until I got to the bathhouse. When I walked in the door, my friends were all in there and I heard Jeremy talking in from the shower. All the blood drained out of my head and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to sit down before I passed out. My friends were freaked out and wanted to know what was wrong. I told them exactly what happened. They nervously made jokes about how I must have been smoking pot. This was long before any of us had experienced with any kind of mind-altering substances, but I could tell that they believed me. Like I said, we had known each other forever, and we knew that we wouldn't exaggerate or play a joke on each other like this, at least not to this extent. I was physically shaking. It was almost impossible for this to be a joke. We all waited together until everyone was finished showering and brushing teeth and whatnot. Then we all walked back together in total silence. When we got to the spot, whoever I had seen was gone without a trace. The water pump was there, though. No one had noticed it before because it was way off the trail and obviously not in use. We got back to our campsite and went to bed thoroughly freaked out. I remember not sleeping much that night. In all my years since then, I've never been able to figure out what happened. Was there a random teenage boy in the woods who looked just like my friend? This is unlikely. Did I hallucinate? Unlikely, but possible. Who's to say? I was in the Boy Scouts as a kid in the South Carolina Low Country. We'd go on campouts about once a month, and one of the campouts that we used to go to regularly belonged to a local man who owned some land way out in the country and let our troop use it for camping. The actual campsite was in a wooded area in the center of a big open field that was maybe 20 acres or so. The guy who owned the land wasn't a full-time farmer, so he had plowed the field but never really planted anything, and the dirt was kind of settled and scrubby, and grass had started to grow. I'm not really sure, I'm not a farmer, maybe there's a name for that or something. Anyway, the western edge of the field was a dirt road that eventually led to the highway. The northern edge was an old field that was planted with trees along enough to go where the trees were fully grown. And it was basically a forest. The southern part used to be a forest, but it was now in the process of being turned into farmland. The trees had all been torn down, but not removed quite yet, so it was just a wasteland of fallen tree trunks and roots. The eastern edge was a swamp, and there's some nasty stuff in swamps in South Carolina so we never really explored it too much. One night, after the post-dinner cleanup, everyone was kind of settling down for the night, so a few friends and I decided to go for a walk. There was a lone tree out in the field about halfway between the campsite and the western edge of the big field, so we walked out and sat under it. There was a full moon out, and the whole field was lit in this sort of luminescent type of glow, and we could see the edges of the field, but not into the forest, swamp, or whatever was beyond. It was creepy, but kind of cool. We hung out for a while, just kind of talking, and then we could see lights in our campsite across the field going out as people started to go to sleep. So, we decided to head back. We got up and start walking, and I heard one of my friends say, Who's that? We all turned to look, and there's this guy standing perfectly still about 100 feet away from us. We could see his silhouette very well thanks to the full moon, but it was too dark to make out any details of his face. We hadn't seen anyone come from the campsite, but the guy looked like an adult, so we assumed one of the four adults who had been on the trip with us was out looking for us. My friend called out to him, and then, this is where it gets really weird. Something that looked kind of like wings slowly unfolded from this guy's head, 
and he remained entirely still. He let out this long, low growling and hooting sound, like imagine if a guy was trying to sound like a dog that was trying to imitate an owl. We all took off running towards the campsite as fast as we could and did not stop until we got there. I looked back out into the field to see if we were being followed, but it was empty. There was nothing in the field at all. We walked around the campsite trying to figure out which adult was messing with us, but they were all in their tents and nobody had left the campsite. Nobody believed us, of course. They just assumed we had been out telling scary stories and freaked ourselves out. But I know what I saw. No, actually I don't know what I saw, but I know it was nothing that we had brought out there with us.